At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Osborne tells us the throne room vision in chapter four is in deliberate contrast with the glory of Caesar's throne. And so as a response to the imperial cult, which was a major source of persecution for the seven churches and one of the key issues in the book as a whole. The details of the scene, the acclamation, the crowns, the worship of the sovereign, the rows of officials, all were seen in Caesar's court. Basically, God will upstage Caesar at multiple points in this book. Why? Because it's the Roman authorities who are responsible for persecuting the church. And it's specifically the imperial cult that causes all the problems. Emperor Domitian wants to be honored as though he's a god. And, and he wants his divinity recognized, and a Christian can't do that. Uh, we see at a, a time after this, Pliny the Younger, uh, in about the year 116, he, he writes that he has been taking Christians into custody, and he tells them, curse Christ and burn a, a small bit of incense to the emperor to acknowledge his divinity, and we'll let you live. If, if you won't do this, then we'll kill you. So the imperial cult and... Caesar's court, this is a problem. So when we look at God's court, we're gonna see that he is consistently upstaging Caesar. Like you're gonna see things here that kind of look like Caesar's court, but they're so much better uh, in the divine courtroom as a way of saying that Jesus is Lord of the whole world and Caesar isn't. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Sardius and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. The author of this book is Jewish, right? He says his name is John. He doesn't say much more than that. Um, a tradition developed about 100 years after Revelation was written that it was John, the son of Zebedee. It's probably not the case since Jesus predicted that he would be martyred. So if this is John, the son of Zebedee, then Jesus is wrong. Uh, so this is probably not a tradition that... Uh, you should latch on to. Uh, but nevertheless, it is some person named John. He doesn't claim to be one of the 12. And uh, he's clearly been around a while. He's probably this person called John the Elder uh, from the epistles of John. Church fathers talk about a John the Elder who's active around Ephesus. Uh, and this is, this is, you know, someone who's an eyewitness to the Christ event, it, it appears. Uh, Nevertheless, he's, he's very Jewish, we can tell. He writes very Semitic Greek. And uh, as a Jew, it looks like he has concern here for the second commandment, that one should not have an image of God. <coughs> now, this is symbolism anyway, right? So he's being hypersensitive. Whatever um, he has to say about God's appearance, it's not literal, right? It's symbolic. But nevertheless, he is more vague and uninvolved when he talks about the one sitting on the throne than when he talks about, for example, the four living beings, or when he talks about the 24 elders. He gives us a, a, a conversation about the rainbow. He talks about the appearance of the person looking like two different types of precious stones, and then he's done. And he moves on and describes all these other things in great detail. It may just be his Jewishness coming through where he doesn't want to dwell upon the image of God, even if it's symbolism. So, on the left, we have Jasper, and on the right, we have Sardius. Uh, Jasper, honestly, could come in a great variety of different colors. We assume it's of the more red variety based on passages in Daniel and Ezekiel, where God has this fiery appearance. Well, what do we make of God's appearance like precious stones, other than the obvious? You know, something that's stunning, something that's beautiful, beautiful something of high value. Well, it has something to say about the restored image of the church uh, in eternity. So the city that appears at the end, New Jerusalem, is not just a place where we live. We are the city, right? It says that the city is the bride. And when you look at the characteristics of the city, uh, it's supposed to reveal things about the church, about who we will be in eternity. And it's interesting that it says the city has the glory of God its radiance is like a most rare jewel, like a jasper. Well, this is, this is God's appearance. So the city is in the image of God. 
throughout this book, there's this invitation to come and participate in God's reign over the cosmos. And so in the imagery, there are these common denominators, some things that characterize God, characterize us, like this jasper. These stones also show up in different combinations on the high priest's high priest breastplate. When we get to the New Jerusalem, we will find that it's built on 12 foundation stones that are modeled upon the high priest's breastplate because we'll all have high priestly access to God in eternity. Remember that the high priest could only go directly into God's presence once a year on the Day of Atonement. He could go into the Holy of Holies and that was it, just him, just once a year. Well, all Christians live on the, on the breastplate, as it were, uh, in eternity because we'll have this high priestly access to God and both of these stones are present on the breastplate. And there's a question as to whether or not there is an allusion here to the rainbow that appears at the time of Noah and if that has any significance. And some will say that it does. If God is surrounded by the rainbow, when he looks through it to see creation, he sees us through his covenant of mercy. Remember, the, the rainbow was to remind God of something, right? Not, not us necessarily. Uh, as it says in Genesis, it shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. Remember, this water uh, is abolished at the end of this book. Uh, some folks say, you know, trying to see God is looking out through the veil of his covenant of mercy. This is a great interpretation, but we don't really see much in the context to elaborate upon this. I'm not so sure that's the case because we're going to meet the four living creatures who are the priests of the natural order and the avengers of the natural order, right? When people do things to harm the world, they have to face these four living creatures who are responsible for the nastiest plagues uh, in the book. We'll talk about some of that next week. 